So in this video we're going to look at a very particular kind of equilibrium which is the equilibrium that's set up when uh, something dissolves in water, when specifically when ionic compounds or salts dissolve in water. All right. So up until now we've been talking about equilibria and uh, how they are defined by their equilibrium constant Keq. Well, when we specifically talk about things dissolving, we give the equilibrium constant a special name. It's called Ksp, and the Sp stands for solubility product. So this is specifically for situations where you've got something dissolving and precipitating in solution. So here's an example. We've got uh, potassium carbonate, and we've put some of that into water. And the forward reaction in this equilibrium is that the solid is dissolving into aqueous ions, which are free in solution. So forward reaction is dissolving. And the reverse reaction is that the free ions in solution are re-precipitating as the solid. So the reverse reaction is precipitating. Um, bear in mind that this is what we would tend to call a physical equilibrium. We're not actually, it's not actually a chemical reaction. We're not uh, producing any new compounds. We're just moving between the solid state and the aqueous state. But it is nevertheless a true equilibrium. Okay, to write the equilibrium expression for uh, a solubility equilibrium, you do it exactly the same way as you do for any other equilibrium. Um, but the thing to remember is that in this kind of equilibrium, the reactant is always solid. It's the, the salt that's dissolving. Uh, and because of this rule that we have, that we ignore the solids and pure liquids, it doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression. So for this particular one, we've got Ksp, solubility product, instead of Keq. It means it, it, it's exactly the same thing. We're just giving it a different name to indicate that it's this particular kind of equilibrium. So we've got Ksp equals, and it's products over reactants. So our products are the potassium ion here, and it has a stoichiometric coefficient of 2, so we raise it to the power of 2, and the carbonate ion, uh, concentration of the carbonate ion. Uh, our reactants, of course, are the solid, and so they get ignored. So that's our equilibrium expression. Okay, so this simulation shows what happens when you add a salt to water. So we've got a salt shaker here, and when I shake it, some crystals come out, and they fall into the water, and you can see each of the crystals is represented as a little sort of crystalline cluster of ions. This is table salt, sodium chloride, so the green ones are chlorides, and the red ones are sodium ions. You can see that when they go into the water, they break apart from their crystal structure and dissolve in the water, and then are able to move freely through the water. Notice that the uh, volume in this simulation, the sort of pretend volume of water in our container, is tiny, 10 to the minus 23 litres. The reason for this is that it then means that this particular number of ions that we've got dissolved in this uh, volume of water actually gives a physically reasonable concentration. So it's it's as if you're really scaling down um, a normal size system like you know shaking some actual salt crystals into a glass of water, scaling it down to you know how small it would be if you could see the individual ions. Um, and you could in fact calculate a concentration from this. So you can see over on the right hand side here uh, we've got sodium, the, a little tally of the sodium and chloride ions, 92 dissolved sodium ions, 92 dissolved chloride ions. If you were to turn that number of ions into moles using Avogadro's number and then divide it by the volume, 5 times 10 to the minus 23 litres, you would arrive at a, uh, at, like I say, a physically reasonable concentration. Okay, so I'm going to add some more salt. And if you watch the tally over here, you can see that the effect is to increase the number of dissolved ions. The bound row here refers to ions that are stuck in crystals. At the moment, we have none of those. It's pretty much as soon as they go into the water, they dissolve. Um, so we've got now 162 sodium ions and chloride ions in the same volume of water. So that means I've increased the concentration of the salt. Um, but at the moment we have no equilibrium. There's, uh, there's dissolving going on, but there's no reverse reaction happening. There's no precipitation. So we're going to keep adding some more salt. 
and eventually we get to a point as you can see now where not all of the crystals dissolve so we have a lump of crystals sitting at the bottom of the container and you can see now if that you look at our tally of ions our dissolved ions about 180 each of sodium and chloride but now we have um, a certain number of bound ions that means the ones that are fixed in crystals about 87 of each now watch the crystals closely and have a look at the edges of them if you watch for a little while you will see that what's going on is that every now and then an iron will detach from the crystal and head off into solution that's the Ford reaction that's the dissolving but equally every now and then an iron will come from solution and attach itself to the crystal that's precipitation that's the reverse reaction and the effect of that if you watch for a while the effect of that is actually to change the shape of the crystal as some parts dissolve and other parts precipitate but overall if you keep watching the tally of bound ions overall the size of the crystal is not changing at all um, if we increase the amount of crystals we're going to add a few more and watch the tally over here there we go before we had about 180 sodium and chloride ions we've added more crystals and we still only have about 180 sodium and chloride ions that are dissolved in solution the only effect of adding more crystals from the shaker was to increase the number of bound ions the undissolved ions in the solution the crystals that are sitting at the bottom so it doesn't matter how much more salt we add at this point can add even more you will see that the number of dissolved ions just does not change change you've reached in fact a saturated solution and this is the point at which an equilibrium has been established when the concentration of the dissolved ions is no longer changing so the equilibrium for this process was the sodium chloride solid in equilibrium with the sodium ions and the chloride ions that were both aqueous so when we write the equilibrium expression for this, it's the KSP, the solubility product, equals the concentration of sodium ions times the concentration of chloride ions. So you can see that the, the solid sodium chloride doesn't appear in this, uh, doesn't appear in this expression, um, and that's due to the fact that it's, concent it's the concentrations we're interested in, and the concentration of a solid doesn't change. Its amount might change, but its concentration never changes therefore it doesn't affect the rates of the forward and reverse reactions and therefore it doesn't affect the position of the equilibrium so uh, when we were adding more crystals in the simulation we weren't affecting the concentration of the sodium ions or chloride ions that were dissolved in water at all now it's interesting to note that the value for the KSP now it's interesting to note that the value for the KSP uh, for sodium chloride is about 36 um, if you think about this it means that the concentrations of the sodium and chloride ions must be quite high because when you multiply them together you get a large number like 36 and this reflects the fact that sodium chloride is very soluble okay let's try a couple of problems so first of all we're going to write the solubility products for each of the salts below and then we're going to work out which of them would be the most soluble so the first one is lead bromide lead 2 bromide so its formula will be PBBr2 and uh, I'll just write out its dissolution equation So there'll be one lead ion and there'll be two bromide ions, so that's what it will look like. And its solubility product expression will be concentration of the lead ion times the concentration of the bromide ion squared. Okay, uh, let's do the next one. Lead carbonate is PBCO3. Um, that's going to dissolve into one lead ion and one carbonate ion and so its KSP is simply going to be the concentration of the lead ions multiplied by the concentration of the carbonate ions and I'll leave you to try the other two for yourself 
All right, now let's look at the values of the KSP and work out which one is the most soluble. Remember that if the KSP is a large number, it means that the concentrations of the ions must also be large because they get multiplied together to make the KSP. So basically, the larger the KSP, the more soluble the salt is. So out of these uh, four to choose from, it is the lead to chloride, which has a KSP of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5, which has the highest KSP. And therefore, it is the most soluble of all of them. This is all relative, though. Obviously, all of these numbers are quite small. Um, in general, lead salts are not very soluble. But lead hydroxide, for instance, is 15 orders of magnitude less soluble than lead chloride. Uh, we would tend to refer to lead hydroxide as insoluble. OK. Um, all right, so let's try this. We've got calcium hydroxide, has a KSP of 5 times 10 to the minus 6. And we're going to add some pure calcium hydroxide to water and allow it to come to equilibrium. And then work out the concentration of the calcium ions in the saturated solution. So as with our other uh, problems of this kind, our two steps are to write the equilibrium expression and to uh, construct an equilibrium table. So our equilibrium expression, calcium hydroxide, has the formula CaOH2. And it's going to dissolve into one calcium ion and two hydroxide ions. So the KSP expression is going to be the concentration of calcium times concentration of hydroxide squared. OK, now we'll construct an equilibrium table. So we'll have initial change and final. We, we're going to ignore the calcium hydroxide solid because it doesn't appear in the expression. We will just look at the calcium and the hydroxide. And we start off with none of either of those. So we've got none. OK, now let's look at the uh, equation. You can see that for every one mole of calcium hydroxide that dissolves, one mole of calcium ions is produced. So let's call the amount of calcium ions that is produced x. And we'll say that at equilibrium, we've got x amount of calcium ions. Now, for every one mole of calcium hydroxide that dissolves, you get two moles of hydroxide. So if x moles of calcium are produced, then two x moles of hydroxide must have been produced. So at equilibrium, we'll have 2x of the hydroxide. OK, we can now substitute into our KSP expression. So we know that the KSP is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. We know that the concentration of calcium ions is x. And we know that the concentration of hydroxide ions is 2x. So it's going to be 2x squared. So we simplify that out. And that gives us x times 4x squared, which is 4x cubed. And that gives us a nice, easy algebraic uh, problem to solve. Simply 4x cubed equals 5 times 10 to the minus 6. And when you simplify that out, you should get that x equals 0 0.0107. Uh, and we're talking about a concentration, so it's moles per litre. All right, so you should always refer back to your equilibrium table. So our concentration of calcium ions at equilibrium was x. So x equals 0 0.0107, that's fine. Part B is what is the concentration of hydroxide ions. In our equilibrium table, hydroxide at equilibrium was 2x. So we can say that the concentration of calcium ions, uh, and we should look at significant figures. We started with 5.02 significant figures. So let's call it 0.011 molar. And our concentration of hydroxide ions will be 0.0107 times 2. 
uh, to two sig figs, which will give 0 0.021 molar. And there's the problem, solved. Okay, uh, now let's calculate the solubility of calcium hydroxide in grams per litre. So we know how many moles dissolve, um, and or rather moles per litre dissolve, and we're going to turn this into grams per litre. So just flicking back to our results, we had concentration of calcium ions at equilibrium was 0.011 molar. So we had concentration of calcium ions at equilibrium was 0.011 molar. That means if you were to put some calcium hydroxide into one litre of water, you would get 0.01 mole of calcium ions. And if you recall, if we just go back to the equation again, the molar ratio between the stoichiometric ratio between the calcium hydroxide solid and the calcium ions is 1 to 1. So if we got 0.011 moles of calcium ions, it means that we must have dissolved the same amount. Uh, so to turn this into a solubility in grams per litre, all we need to do is change this into grams, because if we know that 0.011 moles of calcium hydroxide dissolved in one litre, then converting this into grams will give us solubility in grams per litre. So we just need to use the relationship that uh, mass equals moles times molar mass. And uh, we know our moles, it's 0.011. And the molar mass of calcium hydroxide, if you go and work it out, is 74.12 grams per mole. Uh, and if we calculate that, that gives us a solubility for calcium hydroxide of 0 0.82 grams per litre. So it's not particularly soluble. Less than a gram will dissolve per litre before you get uh, equilibrium. Okay, that's all for now.